Good afternoon. Um, hope everyone's enjoying the meeting so far, a day in, and uh, I will say the uh, location is fabulous. So um, it's a pleasure to be here to tell you a little bit more about Arbor Bio. We are a next generation gene editing company. Um, we were uh, co-founded by Fong Zhang, who's the uh, CRISPR pioneer, and David Walt, who had co-founded uh, companies like Illumina. And they got together, and rather than actually founding the company based on IP, it was actually based on an idea. And, and that idea, at the time, Cas9 was the only approach to think about for gene editing. And so, you know, they realized there was, evolution's probably done a lot of work for us to identify interesting novel editing approaches, so why not uh, mine that and find new interesting approaches for editing? So flash forward six years, we now have a wholly owned toolbox of gene editing technologies. And what's, what's important for us is, you know, if gene editing is truly gonna be a, a modality of the future, like small molecules and biologics, we then need to treat it as such, which means you need to have a, a toolbox of approaches you screen targets against, as opposed to have a single editing approach that hopefully fits for everything. So we do uh, take that approach in, in what we do. The other important piece for us is making sure we can quickly translate uh, these novel technologies into therapeutics as quickly as possible. Um, so we do have a goal of, of three clinical filings over the next three years. First filing will be uh, later this year, which would be, uh, as far as we know, the first non-Cas9 tested in vivo in humans. Uh, we are focused in the liver and CNS, and we have uh, raised considerable cash over the last uh, few years and have some really important partnerships. So if you think, uh, you know, everyone talks about the people at their company, and actually, you know, the three things I think that are critical for success of a company, one is the people, two is the technology, and three is the strategy. And if you have a miss on any one of those, you're screwed. I mean, you're, <laughs> you're, just, you're not gonna be successful. And so you've gotta make sure you've got all three of those pieces. And so i um, very proud of the, the folks we have, very experienced in translating these novel technologies into um, uh, INDs and CTAs in this space. And so that experience is really helpful. Our scientific founders are also very involved in the company. Um, uh, Fong chairs our SAB and David Walt is on our board. So the people, we've, we've got great people. What about the technology? So the way we've really uh, built this is there's a lot of metagenomic data out there. You can get, you know, we have a lot of privately sourced and there's a lot of publicly available data but it's all in very different forms. So you need to have some very talented computational biology folks who can quickly take the data, synthesize, and identify things of interest using a lot of uh, the fancy computer tools we have now that are uh, well outside of my development biologist background. But these folks are really talented and they can quickly identify um, tens of thousands of potential systems, whatever we're looking for, whether we're looking for nucleases, reverse transcriptases, or other ACEs. But importantly, um, we can then put these through a, a high throughput screening platform to characterize them. Because in the case of a nucleus, you want to know how big is it? How big is the guide? What's the PAM? What is the uh, cut type? All these pieces are important because at the end of the day, we need to identify systems that will add to our toolbox and we can then move them over. The other important piece for us in our platform is that uh, many of these uh, systems because we're looking very, very far on the sort of the far reaches of, of evolution, um, you know, systems that are like found in bacteria that are in like uh, deep sea vents or random places like that, they've never encountered mammalian cells, so they often actually don't work very well in mammalian tissue, so we have to engineer them. And our engineering approach, again, taking a lesson from what others have done, we know that uh, structure-based approaches work. So we can generate crystal structures of these, uh, nucleases or whatever else we're looking at, and um, use that based on our prior work to generate SAR, so structure activity relationships, which I love using that term in a cell therapy meeting because it's usually resolved for a small molecule world, but very important to really allow us to very efficiently and quickly engineer these systems. So now you have a toolbox of systems. You know, why does it matter? Well, we know that Cas9, for example, um, does have limitations. So one, it, it tends, it's quite large, so you can't fit it into um, AV 
particularly if you want to couple it to some other um, effectors. Uh, you do have PAM limitations. So the PAM is the, uh, it's kind of like the zip code that tells the uh, nucleus where it can bind on DNA. Uh, Cas9 also has a, it's a double strand blunt cut, and then you also have uh, off target elements. So for us, having small sizes so we become delivery agnostic, um, a broad range of PAMs, and then varied cut types, because depending on the type of editing you want to do, sometimes you want a blunt cut, sometimes you want an overhang. And uh, you know, we've uh, profiled some of our work in various publications, which is uh, helpful. So now we've got this underpinning of nucleases. How do we deploy them and where? So we, we, as we looked at the broad range of uh, genetic diseases, there's sort of four buckets of diseases. So those, those diseases where you want to just knock something down or, or remove where you have too much of a protein in some way, shape, or form. So we call that knockdown plus. Um, there's other areas where you may want to, um, you've got a few point mutations, you just want to rewrite or fix those mutations. So we can couple it to a nucleus to reverse transcriptase and rewrite that section. There's other diseases where you have repeat expansions, whether it's a hexanucleotide repeat or some other repeat expansion that you need to cut out and remove. And so um, you know, that's another focus area. And the fourth area is really around large insertions. Inserting larger pieces of DNA in vivo into the endogenous locus, not into landing pads in this particular case, because in vivo, we really want to use the endogenous control machinery to uh, control what we're doing. So those are our areas of focus. Now, what we do is uh, a little bit, you know, as, as an approach you would take for any new modality. So you have a target. We build what we call a target effector profile. And then we screen heavily against our toolbox to identify the right approach, which allows us, again, to find the right tool for the right job. You know, the, so the technology we feel is sound. The strategy is important. So, you know, as you think about, I think the other place that's probably probably causes the most angst in new companies is what's your lead indication? Where do you want to start and why? And as, so as we've looked at this space, we really wanted to find somewhere where we could be the first editing approach in that disease, somewhere where we could um, leverage existing delivery modalities. Um, LMPs are pretty well validated, so we know liver is a good place to start. And areas where you have a clear clinical and, and regulatory and development path. And so uh, primary hyperoxaluria fit the bill for us. Um, it really checked all those boxes. Beyond that, as we think about the rest of our portfolio, we've got a, a portfolio in um, CNS, particularly focused on ALS targets in vivo. And then as we move uh, to other indications in the liver, it's really keeping a focus on areas where we can do things that are unique. And so moving to RT editing approaches there. Our portfolio is very focused. Um, uh, we want to make sure we have programs that you know, we can move ahead, and we're very focused on those. We do partner, um, particularly in the ex vivo space, we uh, partner um, with folks where they can get access to our technology and do whatever sort of fancy edits they need to do to their cells. Uh, we just announced uh, recently with Allergena uh, a couple of weeks ago a partnership there. So we are delivery agnostic. I think you know, we we don't feel there's going to be one delivery technology that's going to solve all the problems out there. So, you know, we're, we're fine if it's viral, we're fine if it's non-viral, as long as it gets to the cells we need to get to, and uh, in a safe manner. And so we, we have partnerships to allow us to access LMPs, as well as AAV, and, and we do have a partnership with 4DMT to really access their next-gen capsids for use in some uh, CNS indications, for example. So, you know, what does a, a, an in vivo editor look like? Well, you've got some sort of delivery vehicle, in this case an LMP, and inside you've got your uh, payload. It's so pretty straightforward. The other important piece as we think about drug development is making sure that we have a very um, structured approach so that we are, again, very efficient on both cost and time. So, you know, we start in human cells where we do our screening that I talked about. We can identify what is the optimal approach for that particular target. Move those leads into uh, murine models where we can really do the PKPD work, get the proof of biology we need, give us confidence to move to NHPs where we can then do, kind of finalize our development candidate, run talks and, and, and move forward into humans for there. So that's our very structured approach in, in thinking about it which allows us to keep our scientists focused because, you know, 
all of us who are scientists know we sometimes get distracted by shiny objects, and so making sure that they're laser focused on, this is our approach, here's how we do it. And yes, there'll be lots of shiny objects along the way, but we'll leave those for another day. So uh, just to hit on primary hyperoxaluria. So this is a disease that uh, oftentimes uh, children are diagnosed as toddlers with kidney stones. So if you can imagine a two-year-old having kidney stones, and the kidney stones, um, we, we talked to a patient, and she, she saved all her kidney stones so over the last 20 years. It was like this, like a mason jar full of them. And they look like sea urchins. So they're not your typical round stone that you know, passes out and hurts. These are like a sea urchin that just claws its way out and just destroys the kidney on the way out. So that by the time these um, kids are in their teens and early adulthood, their kidneys are shot. So they're either in, on dialysis or they've had transplant. So it's a pretty devastating disease. And that's because you get a, uh, there's a mutation in this uh, particular enzyme that converts glyoxylate to glycine. So you don't convert um, the glycine. So everything sh shunts to oxalate. Oxalate is uh, insoluble, which forms stones as well as oxalosis or on other organs. So we can intervene by effectively um, killing the HA01 gene, as you see here, where we build up glycolate, which is water soluble. Um, I'll skip the, the patient numbers in the interest of time. The, the, so I'll show you three um, pieces of data. First is the work we do in vitro to think through. So we, our talented computational folks can quickly, based on our target effector profile, identify, you know, in this case, 57 approaches that could potentially work. We then do uh, some screening work in hex cells to identify those approaches that have the highest, um, in this case, headed inefficiency move those approaches into primary cells, test them in primary hepatocytes, identify, uh, the, the, in this case, the guides that are most efficient, the nucleus that's most efficient, do the off-target work, do some potency work, and then we've got some leads we can bring into animals. This is a, an experiment we did in some wild-type mice. Um, it's a really nice time course experiment looking at editing over time versus impact on that protein that we're, uh, uh, the enzyme we're targeting to see if those protein levels go down. And then what impact does that have on the biomarker glycolate? So on the left-hand side, you can see editing is in that little red bar. You can see it begins to come up after a few hours and really tops out after 24 to 48 hours. This is delivered via LMP. We also see the um, protein levels then begin to come down by about two days and then eventually uh, head on down towards zero as that protein is uh, um, exhausted in the cells. And then finally, you can see the, the, the glycolate biomarker really moves up after about two days and then shoots up a lot higher after that. So this kinetics is really important because it helps us identify what is our target profile as we move into NHPs, what do we need to hit to actually be confident that you know, we have a potential therapy here. So I'll show you some uh, NHP data. So here we really had to do a series of, of non-human primate experiments to start Picking the right guide. We had a couple lead guides. We needed to know what was the most efficient guide approach to take uh, forward. So what you see here is measured indel. So that's the efficiency of editing in the hepatocytes in the animal. We knew from the mouse and other work that we wanted to hit about 55% editing, which hits about 85 to 90% of the hepatocytes. So we picked a guide. We then had to pick an LMP formulation we liked in that second sort of uh, set of bars did some dose response work, and then finally put the pieces together, and as you can see in the, the sort of reddish uh, bar, you know, exceeded our, our threshold on editing. Um, tolerability is, is good. It looks uh, like we've got good tolerability there, and um, you know, we're focused on filing this one later this year. So that's a flavor for you know, the types of things we do. We, we do have in vivo data across multiple CNS programs as well, and I'll just skip quickly to um, one last piece of data. In the interest of time. So this is in the large insertion space, so where we can insert a large piece of DNA. Um, historically, there's been a bunch of approaches you can use, um, trying to use a nuclease to insert a piece of DNA. And what we've tried to do here is really identify an approach that allows you to do it more efficiently in uh, terminally differentiated cells with our technology than you can with other technologies. And part of this is due to the cut type of the particular nucleus. You can see we see pretty good integration. And this was recapitulated actually in vivo in uh, mouse livers where we saw you know, between about 15% uh, integration of a large insertion in frame into an, a, a specific site we wanted to. So 
hopefully that gives you a flavor of the, the type of technology we have at Arbor, um, as well as uh, how we think about developing uh, new therapies. So um, with that, I'll, I am at time, so thank you very much.